This, uh, we have a nice small group. This is kind of nice this afternoon. So um, I'm going to be focusing on kids and the impact on children. And my plan today is this morning, I'm just going to share a little bit of my personal story with you all before we get onto the slides. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, disclosure and issues and what to, how to talk to kids, what to share with kids, that type of thing. And then we'll just talk about the impact on kids and how to ameliorate some of that impact. So it's a lot to cover in a 70 minutes. So um, I will um, do my best. We'll, we'll see how far we can get. So um, I mentioned to y'all earlier that I was 11 when I found out about my father's sex addiction. So for me, that was like um, one of those uh, flashbulb moments where you, like, you remember exactly where you were when the space shuttle went off. So that's how my uh, recollection of that uh, moment was. Um, my father has uh, his safety zone is anything to do with cars or boats. And so he was, we were in a car, and that's, I think, you know, part of that is just that's his comfort zone. But I remember where we were parked. I remember the weather that day. Um, we were kind of by a lake, and, you know, I remember people playing on the lake. I mean, it was really that kind of event. And I, you know, I chalk that up to being traumatic. That's one of the things that happens during traumatic events. We remember everything around us. So um, it was definitely a very scary time. Uh, my father was always my closest parent. And so we had always had a very, um, you know, deep connection. So for me to hear um, uh, that he was a sex addict at 11, it it's very hard at that age, first to even understand sex, let alone addiction, let alone the two in combination, because it's like, you know, a very, they're abstract concepts for someone who's 11. So I remember feeling very confused about that. I remember feeling um, very protective of him, like I wanted to rescue him and, um, you know, sort of save him, bail him out. Um, and there were some things that I think he did really, really well and some things that I probably wouldn't encourage people to replicate. Um, one thing that I think was really done well in my family was we had been in therapy since I, I, I started, I was in my first family therapy session when I was seven. And so we always had used therapy as some as like a resource. So we had a therapist that we were connected to, and the the way it was pitched to us was, um, you can bring anything up in therapy that you want to, and you won't get in trouble for it. And so we did. We would use it. We would bring up issues, and <laughs> it was like we we maximized that. Um, so I think that was really well done. And after the disclosure, we all went to therapy. And one of the things that my um, father said, uh, has, has said repeatedly in my life, is the only thing I owe my kids is education and therapy. <laughs> And he's made good on that. And I've taken him up on that because I was in therapy almost um, all of my teenage years and through college. And um, I remember feeling very angry for a period of time, went through a period of time where I really pushed both of my parents away and really, um, you know, didn't talk with them on any re real deep level for years. Um, so I had to... And I continued to uh, work in therapy. And that was, um, I had, a, in, when I was in college, I had a very good therapist who did EMDR and internal family systems work with me. And um, I really used that process. I didn't realize that, that that's what I was doing at the time, but it was incredibly healing for me. So, um, you know, I really believe in the power of that for, for healing kids and for them having that as a resource. Um, some of the things that were challenging for us, I think, um, his uh, second wife, which was my stepmother at the time, was very, very angry, and um, he, f he felt like he had to disclose because she was going to tell us every everything, and so it was kind of like a forced disclosure situation. He, she said, I'm going to tell him, you have to tell him, and so he felt forced to do that. Um, and in that process, she shared uh, pretty detailed information with my sister. And so we had gotten different pieces of information. 
And so siblings are like the information superhighway. So we all shared and that was, we were like putting pieces of, pu of the puzzle together. So that was really kind of, um, you know, that was a weird process, kind of. And I was very grateful to have my siblings during that process. I have two that were close in age and one that was significantly younger. And I think that had I not had those two siblings to talk to about it, I just would have really struggled more than I did. Um, so I felt like at least I had somebody there that I could really connect to. So I think if, if people have only children, it's really important that they have you know, a cousin or some, uh, uh, some close friends that they can really trust to connect with about it. Because kids you know, are very careful about, uh, and should be very careful about bringing this kind of thing up at school and sharing it with their peers. Because I think it's just, kids are so mean. And you know, um, I think they, we need to be protective of them in terms of um, you know who they talk to and what have you. But anyway, I felt very, um, very supported uh, by my siblings in having that process. Um, let's see what else. Um, it, you know, on on the other hand, it was even though it was very painful. It did put pieces of the puzzle together for me in terms of my, my parents' divorce, which happened when I was two, and helped me start putting things together. So um, that was helpful. Had I had my druthers, I would have rather had it later because I think it was too, too soon. But it was good to start to be able to understand what had happened in the, the first marriage and my, my dad's second marriage. So um, let's see what else can I share with you. I did go through a period of time of, of using drugs and alcohol and ex you know experimenting with that. And um, I think part of that was out of the trauma and the pain and confusion of what I was dealing with. So fortunately, I've never struggled with drug dependency. So that was you know lucky, I think. But um, uh, the other thing that I, I did as a result of all of this is I felt like, I think I did a little withdrawing from the family. Um, I went on, uh, uh, I, I, went, I was a foreign exchange student. I decided I needed to become a foreign exchange student. And I, thought, I think that was actually a resilient coping mechanism for me. So um, kind of got out of the country and went to France for a year and then um, went off to school you know, a year later. And so that was a really good thing. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, you know, having my own interests and my own, you know, putting my energy in what I wanted to do was really helpful for me at that time. He was very good at sharing his recovery. He's always been, always been very open. I feel kind of lucky when I hear other situations because I had a parent that was accountable and owned it and then also provided therapy and was there for some for the cleanup of that. I don't think all kids get that. So he we talked about it. We talked about it on an ongoing basis. He continued to share his recovery. Yeah, the I think the fact that we all got disclosure separately and got different information was yeah. That was hard. I had gotten some details from him about that he felt he needed to tell me what bro that broke up his first marriage. And that was really, and my sister didn't have that information. And then she got information from the, my stepmom that was different and too detailed. So there was a little bit too much detail that happened and it was inconsistent across the sharing. And I wouldn't recommend that. Yeah. Uh, when I married my husband, you would have I you wouldn't I would have never thought he was an addict. I felt like I was being very careful when I selected him, and um, I when I had my disclosure, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I had no idea. So it was I was in that group that was totally in the dark, knew nothing, and I thought he had a mood disorder. I thought he was bipolar, which he is. So I thought, you know, that that's what I was wrestling with, and I did not know the other. And so I replicated, even though I 
had a lot of therapy. I was highly educated on the subject. I clearly saw the patterns. I still married somebody that had the same issues, which is very, I think, discouraging. I think it's discouraging for people to hear that because it's like everybody wants to protect their kids and not see that happen. But I do think that our, um, our family of origin is very, like, it's amazing to me how we replicate stuff from our families. It's just, uh, you know, a profound uh, life experience that I just see repeatedly. And I don't want people to feel like you shouldn't have hope that you can, can't protect your kids because I have worked with families in which one branch of the family has gotten in recovery and the kids aren't addicts and all the other branches are. So I think that recovery serves as a perfect protective factor for kids and can. Um, I am the only one in my family that married an addict. There were four kids. So, and there was more addiction in my family, so I don't know what that means about me, but <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, maybe, I, and I kind of, you know, I look to that and I look at my first marriage and I think this all happened for a reason, you know, so I could, you know, teach and, and share and, you know, help, so. There is one chapter on disclosure to ch kids that I wrote, one article on disclosure to kids that I wrote, and um, the other two articles on kids are by the perspective of the parents, and that's it. There's nothing else. So this is like an area of literature that is really, really, um, we, we're kind of where we were with partners like 10 years ago for the kids. So I'm hoping that people will take this on as a research area and I'm hoping to do a book eventually. I've got a couple other ones that are in the pipeline that I want to finish first. So yeah. Yeah, I don't think, I, I, what, one thing I'm gonna share is that I think you have to have a rationale for disclosing to kids and it needs to be in their best interest. And so I don't think we just disclose to all children just to, for the sake of disclosure. It's not for the addict's healing or something. We're gonna evaluate what's in the best interest of the child. Yeah, so, okay. So let's charge into it. So I was in New York recently and I was speaking at a conference and it was on the topic of disclosure to children and had this kind of a similar reaction where this lady stands up and she, and we had, hadn't st started speaking yet and she slams her hand on the desk and she says, why would you ever want to talk about sex addiction to a child? And she was very vehement about it. And I said, you know, that's a good question. That's a really good question. So, but it's not, it's just as simple as that because there are times when you have to and when it's in their best interest and it you really have to take it apart and evaluate what when why and there's a lot of different circumstances and it's not always easy there are times when it's a really really challenging decision and you always the way I phrase it um, to my trainees is you always want to work with the parents who know their children best to help them come to a determination of what they're, they feel comfortable with in, in making this decision. It needs to be the parent's decision ultimately. You can provide recommendations and tell them what you, what you think, but ultimately they need to feel comfortable with it and feel like it's the right thing for them. So um, uh, I kind of coined this terminology in mending um, my book where the chapter is on disclosure to kids as and, and we have five different types of disclosures so the first one is a forced disclosure so a forced disclosure is dad's gonna be on the six o'clock news and we we have to tell the kids because they're good they're gonna find out from some sort of non nurturing means whatever that non nurturing source of information is gonna be that's the that's a forced disclosure so, um, you know, you want, th these are actually the hardest situations because unfortunately you're sometimes sharing information with the kids that's not age appropriate. Pardon? Like the Duggars, right? Where you have, and, and this is really common in, in situations where there's been an arrest or something like that too, where, you know, some explanation needs to be given to the child if there was offending behavior or something like that. So these can be really challenging situations. 
Um, the second type is a softened disclosure. So a softened disclosure is when the child is too young to understand the concept of sex addiction. So in our article, um, it's an article by Claudia Black, Diane Dillon, and I, and our recommendation was mid-adolescence in terms like 15, 16, uh, before talking to your kids about sex addiction. And that's if possible. There are some circumstances where it makes sense to do it earlier, so I'll talk about those. But prior to that, you're kind of doing a more softened uh, disclosure approach. Um, so let's say you have, uh, I'll give some examples, like I had um, uh, a colleague who was a female sex addict. She had multiple, uh, many, many affairs in her marriage, and the children had found out about one of them. And the, ch the child knew this person and knew they were together and what have you. So her uh, disclosure to the child was, and it was like she was like seven or eight, and the disclosure was, mommy has a boyfriend, mommy not, is not supposed to have a boyfriend, daddy's supposed to be mommy's only boyfriend. I want you to know that that relationship is over, I'm fully committed to daddy, this, you know, we are working this out, you don't have to worry about us, and this is not anything, that you haven't done anything you know, wrong, this isn't about you, this is something about, you know, between daddy and I. So very much using age-appropriate, developmentally appropriate language for the child. Another example um, uh, had an uh, instance where the child discovered the porn on the computer and dad was in recovery. Child's too young to, to hear about sex addiction and to understand that. So it's, you know, uh, daddy was looking at pictures of people without their clothes on on the computer. Uh, having sex, you know, this is not part of our value system in our family. This is not what we want to do. Daddy, that you know, daddy says that you know, disclosure comes from the parent that has is needs to be accountable, usually, if possible. So, this isn't part of my value system. I don't want to be doing this. We are this is what I'm doing to take care of it. We're putting filters on the computer, we're putting the so you're taking some ownership, and sometimes doing some sort of softened disclosure if there's been conflict and tension and the kids are feeling it, sharing something with them to help them make sense of what's going on so they don't feel crazy can be the best situation. So even like, you know, uh, daddy lied to mommy or daddy hurt mommy or mommy hurt daddy and this is that's why we've been fighting and it's not about you and you don't have to worry, we're working it out, but that's why mommy's been sad. And, you know, it's then you're putting a context and language for the emotions going on and then, they're, then they don't feel crazy. Like there's stuff that there's going on that they don't want to, they can't talk about. So that type of thing. And so you would just cater the language to the age level of the child, what's appropriate for the age level of the child. Um, now that is usually followed up with a delayed disclosure. So let's say, um, like my friend who had had repair, uh, affairs, repeated affairs, once her daughter was older, she was a, a mid-teen, uh, she shared her recovery with her. You remember when I you know, had, had that affair when, when you were younger? Well, I want to let you know I'm in recovery for sex addiction and this is what it is. And, and the purpose of her sharing that was to share her be you know share her recovery with her child share you know have a, a increased level of intimacy with the child now you really want to evaluate whether that's appropriate with given what's going on with the child and that relationship so um, each one of these cases is unique and you know you really want to individualize a plan for them so, but a delayed disclosure is usually taking ownership of the addiction and saying, I, I, you know, it's actually a sex addiction and I've been in recovery for these years at a later point in time. Uh, unbalanced disclosure is when it comes from the angry partner to the child. Unfortunately, that happens a fair bit. Um, and so what it comes from, the, the terminology comes from uh, Mnuchin's uh, structural family therapy in which you have one parent that's um, uh, overly connected or parentifying a child in the relationship. So um, 
yeah, naturally you would not want to have a disclosure that's um, coming from the angry parent, especially if the angry parent's in a state of anger about it. Um, and obviously the last one is discovery. So this is what, um, you know, the uh, uh, lady back there just brought up, like the, what happens when the child discovers. So like, for example, I, I worked with a, a boy who discovered the porn and the dad had used the porn in his room on his computer and was having prostitutes in his bed in his room. And was the one that made the discovery and brought it to mom. So that's very difficult. That's very traumatic for a child to make that kind of discovery. And those two can be situations in which you're really having to come in and do damage control and offer support. So um, what I mentioned earlier, we really want to look at what is the rationale for why we'd be sharing with the child. What are we hoping that the child gets out of it? And we should be able to identify why it's in the child's best inf interest. So if you have a child that knows absolutely nothing, you're sure that they know nothing, um, they're doing well, the, everything's stable, there's not a lot of confusion, it might be better for them not to know until later. You know, then you might postpone that. Um, in our study, one of the things we found is a lot of times the children did know when we did the interview, two-thirds of the time. They knew before they were told. So we interviewed a sample. We had 89 kids who had been through disclosure. 67% of the sample knew before they were told. So kids are really smart and perceptive. They pick things up. Um, they really know. And if that's the case, and then you, you know you think they know then it's I think much better to provide some clarity and some answers and to do either a softened disclosure or a, a regular disclosure given their age and provide clarity because sometimes what they make up in their head is much worse and a lot of them don't they are afraid of sex addiction they think pedophile they think child molester they think sex offender and they don't know the difference and so you can educate and help them understand that. Um, now, for those that did not know before, disclosure was a negative experience, so, which makes sense. I think for most of the sample, disclosure was a negative experience, did not want, and they did not want the information to be true, mainly, right? So, um, so rationales include validating what they already know, exposure, it's a forced situation, they're, you know, there's going to be, they're going to find out in a non-nurturing means. If there's a safety issue to protect the, the welfare of the children, um, or, you know, breaking the generational cycle, sharing recovery with the child when they're old enough, um, when that feels appropriate. So here's a, uh, a few questions here. What age is appropriate? We kind of hit that, the, that 15, 16 um, age group. I think my what should I do? If you think your child knows, they probably already know because given the data on that. So one thing we'll often suggest is to get the child into therapy, get them to establish a relationship with a therapist, and have the therapist explore and see if there's anything that they know. Um, can I tell my older child and not the younger one? Well, I think, you know, like I said before, siblings are the information superhighway, right? So I think it depends on the age difference. If there's a wide age gap, sometimes you can get away with that. But if they're close in age, and you know, then you know that they're going to share information. So I usually pitch the message to the youngest common denominator. So kind of pitch the message for the youngest kid and tell them all the same thing. Um, we can't agree on what to tell them. What, what should we do? These are, the most, these are the most challenging situations when you have one parent that wants to do one thing and one parent that doesn't. And that's really, really hard. So I usually try my best to work with the parents and ask them to really consider the best interests of the child. The, the children need their parents to be a unified front, um, and it's really best for the disclosure to come from the addict taking ownership of it and um, with the partner there, if possible, taking a non-victim role. And if you have that, that's a, you know, that tends to be a little healthier format than um, you know, doing a, 
uh, unbalanced disclosure or just coming from one parent. So, any questions so far? Yeah. If a child is if a child is showing. Um, you know, like an older teenage child, is showing similar um, behaviors that you have, do you need to disclose to them? Right, okay, so I've had that situation where you have like a 16-year-old like a boy who's starting to use porn and dad's in recovery for porn. I think of that as an opportunity. So in a situation like that, dad can come to the 16-year-old and say, hey, look, I gotta tell you, I've, I've been in recovery from this. I got in, I got in a, a, over my head with porn and I found it was really, unhealthy for me and I want to share my this is what I've been doing to to not go there and you know do it as a positive role model and that would be a great rationale of why it's in the child's best interest you know what I'm saying so you can there are circumstances like that where you think this would really be in this kid's best interest for dad to step up here and to share about that so that's a great example of that do you think it would be better if the parent themselves did it or if they maybe had a therapist involved as well? I think it depends on the parent's comfort level and their relationships with therapy. You want a lot of, you know, sometimes I have parents I'll, you know, th that they'll say, you know, do you want to have the disclosure in, in the therapy office or do you want to um, do it at home? And someone will be like, I think we'd be much more comfortable just doing it at home with ourselves or, and other parents will be like, yeah, I think we should be here. I, th I think we need your support. So I think it all just depends on the comfort level of the parent. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, I really try to, in these circumstances, I really try to talk to the parents about really um, kind of putting aside their differences to focus on what's best for the kids and coming to a determination and evaluating what's in the kid's best interest. This would, you know, and making an argument for what would be best for them and try and get them on the same page with that because it's much better to have agreement. Um, so next one, my child's in struggling in life, will this put them over the edge? Is a tricky question because we don't know if the child's struggling because they know about the addiction and don't know, haven't talked about it, or are they already struggling and then you add this on top and it, it just is another, you know, if they're running away or they're eating disordered or they're using or whatever it is. So. Um, again, this is a situation of where it would be really helpful to get the kid, the child into therapy. Try, try and figure that out. And how to share this information with them. I mentioned before that it's best to have the addict. Obviously, there's a timing component too. You want the addict to have some recovery under their belt. Sh you know, really, you know, have some, you don't want to have somebody that's kind of riding the fence of recovery. They share with their child that they're a sex addict and then they're not in recovery anymore. Then they're dating another person and uh, that happens and that's not a great, then the child's like, what do I make of that? You know, so you want to really invested in their recovery, have some traction under their belt. The disclosures happened with the partner. The partner, you know, hopefully is, um, you know, doing well themselves and can participate in this with the, with the child. So there's a little bit of a um, stepwise progression that leads up to this. Okay, um, reasons given that the parents chose not to disclose. So this is one of the articles that was done on the parents' perceptions of disclosure. Um, fear of loss of the relationship with the partner or the child, fear of hurting the child, fear of the children's negative response to the parent and the parent doesn't feel ready. So that's what, why parents choose not to disclose. And this is the parents' descriptions of children's reactions to disclosure. Um, shock, disbelief, fear, sadness, tearfulness, expressed anger, validation of their suspicions and knowledge. Um, some appeared to understand but blocked out the information were, and were surprised when told again later. So uh, we can never underestimate the power of repression in children. It's so common and they just forget, they don't remember. And so to, you don't want to bring it up, bring something up and then no, not talk about it again. You know, it has to be kind of something that is revisited and that um, you, you continue to share your recovery and what's going on. Um, attempts to comfort the parents and praise for, par to, for the parents for seeking recovery. Um, once we got into doing the survey with the kids, uh, we decided, we, we thought, oh, we wish we had asked them one question. So out of the 89 respondents, only 29 were asked 
if they were glad they were told. We wish we had asked the whole sample, but it was not in part of the original. So uh, out of the 29 that were asked that, 20 responded affirmatively, said that they were glad that they were told. But most reported that they didn't like the experience of disclosure and didn't want the information to be true. Okay. Um, so this was from our study, the children's reactions. Um, there was fear of financial ramifications, fear of sex addiction, that the parent was a pervert or a child molester, confusion about the impact on the family, emotional compliance, caretaking behavior, immediate relief and validation, and anger. One of the participants said, I felt like I wanted to punch them, but I just sat there. Uh, here's a few of the quotes from the participants. I can't be totally honest about anything anymore because I'm bound to keep his secret, so a good part of my life is a big fat lie now. I felt sick, horrified. What are other people going to think? Can I be left alone, home alone with him? I was not crazy. I had known all along. And a couple more. I felt twinge twinges of guilt and a sense of needing protect to protect my dad. My dad was going on about his being a sex addict and treatment and steps and other stuff that I could care less about, and the word bankruptcy came up at the time we were being sued, and that really struck a chord with me. What did that mean for me? Would I lose my bike? <laughs> so, you know, kids can be very concrete like that in terms of what are the consequences going to be for this. Um, we, they were mostly were young adults. Um, they, they were retrospectively looking back on their disclosures. So, yeah, most of them were young adults. So things that we want to consider, the developmental maturity level. You have some that are 15 going on 25 and some that are 15 going on 9. You know, so really they're, they're, they vary so much. Uh, are they at risk? What are the dynamics in the family? So if you um, like look at the relationships in the family, if the child's always been really close to dad, it's going to be, you know, to who, let's say dad's the addict, and the child's always been really close to dad, that's going to be really hard for them to digest that information. If they're really close to mom, they might feel really protective of mom and wanting to, you know, support mom. And so sometimes you can get loyalty issues, you know, going uh, amongst the kids trying to protect one parent or another. Um, you always want to look at the sibling constellation and trying to find if there's a good positive reason for the disclosure. So you were talking about the loyalty. Um, is there any way that the, not the addict, but the other parent, um, if they're angry or upset, what's a way that they can help the balance that loyalty so it's not one-sided? Because that's not fair to anyone, really. So is there, is there a way to do that? What I would advise the uh, angry partner to do is not to rely emotionally upon the child for like as a confidant um, and to try and really share that anger with peers and support people in their lives and try not to put, you know, put that out there in front of the child. I mean, it's also, I mean, children are going to see their feelings, and it's okay to have feelings in homes and to cry and stuff like that. But, you know, I think it's the, when, when the parents start to emotionally unburden themselves on their child that it's really hard on the children. And they, you know, they end up getting uh, very emotionally invested in caretaking and that kind of thing, parent, get it parentified. So um, that would be one piece of advice I would have for that parent. Did that answer your question? Yeah? Okay. Okay. All right, so just like a disclosure with a partner, we want the addict to be in recovery. We want them to be accountable, out of denial, really working a program, um, be in a place where they can convey hope about their recovery process, when they can demonstrate behavioral changes. Um, so we want the addict to be in that place. Now, if the partner is having a difficult time being an uh, effective parent and some explanation needs to be given, that may be a consideration of doing a, maybe a softened disclosure or something like that. 
Um, also, after the, uh, it would be helpful to wait until the partner is, is a little past the initial shock and rage because we don't want to put that out on the children during the disclosure. So, um, and then of course we're going to look at the child factors, like is it a forced issue, how old are they, do they already know, all of those things. Yeah, it's like, it's a lot like grief, where you just don't know how they're going to respond. Some people have a delayed response, some can't process it right away, others, you know, have an immediate response, are, you know, devastated, really angry, so you just don't, never know, and it's, I think it's best to have, you know, be prepared with having an, op you know, a resource for them. So, yeah, great example, thank you. Um, okay, so adult children. My bias is that it, adult children should be told. I think it's a gift that in recovery we can give our adult children to share our, our recovery process with them. Uh, Carl Jung has a famous quote. It says, the most important gift a parent can give a child is to tell them about their dark side. Telling children about your struggles helps them developmentally to have a realistic picture of what it means to be human. I think that's really true. I know that in my relationship with my dad, it's, you know, because, I think because I know what he's been through and understand that whole, you know, everything that, that happened, we have sort of a, a deeper relationship. And when I have struggles, he's one of the people that I go to about that because we have that, a, a deeper, more, you know, a real, authentic relationship. And I think that is a gift you give your kids. And also just the fact of providing them with information about their family and their history and um, you know, helping them put all the pieces of the puzzle together about their lives. So I'm always one for telling adult kids. I think it's always just a matter of timing and when that's appropriate. Okay, so healthy disclosures. Um, kind of hit the first point. If a therapist is present, it, I, I would say if the if they're comfortable with that. You know, I've had families do their do it at home and have it uh, go very well. So um, you know, if they want a therapist present, or they could do it at home. Um, both parents should strategize uh, about what is to be shared and be in agreement around that and have understanding of that. Uh, neither parent takes the role of victim, child is not used as a confidant, and we recommend that the disclosure come from the addict with the spouse present if possible. So they're kind of owning it. Um, we recommend developmentally appropriate sharing at the child's age level, and also guided by the child's need, desire to know. Uh, Jennifer Schneider kind of coined that terminology, and she uses it with partner disclosures too where you kind of, you know, you give the information and then kind of see how much, do they want more? Do they have more questions? In my experience, children don't t tend to really want the details. They, get, they want the information and they might have some questions about it, but they don't tend to go after the details. Um, but I kind of, you know, you know respect, you know, their uh, need, desire to know. And so it's helpful to get the parents to say, okay, this is what we're going to share, this is what we're not going to share, so that they're on the same page before they go in and, and do it. Okay, Keep it an open dialogue that can come back and, and uh, be discussed later. Um, teaching children about healthy sexuality, I think, is really important in this situation. Um, that 12-year-old uh, that I told you about that found the, prostitute in the, the prostitutes in the room and the porn on the computer, he came in when he was 12 and it, for individual sessions and he's, he said, I think I'm a sex addict, he says to me. And I said, well, why do you think that? He goes, because I think about girls all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, honey, you're supposed to, you're 12. <laughs> That's normal. You know, so we kind of went through all of that. And I know, so sweet. Oh. But they, you know, they have that it's normal to have that kind of fear and to not understand, to not know. And so just educating about, you know, sex is beautiful and it's wonderful and it can be a magical part of your relationship and, you know, try, you know, really the positive aspects and, and, you know, just educating them on the basics 
And all of that is so important, I think, because there can, this can create a lot of confusion in the family. So just regular, healthy sex education. Um, I think that's really important. Um, the other one is consistency with information and routines. I think the most, some of the most challenging situations I've seen is like, dad's a sex addict and now you don't get to see dad anymore, or now we have to move, you know, now we can't go to this person's house, your best friend's house anymore, or now we, so anytime you can keep that, that's, you know, kids thrive in that consistency, keeping their environment the same, not making a lot of changes when the family's going through this kind of thing can really help stabilize them. Um, that can be really helpful. Um, no gory details, obviously, for the children, and also assuring them that they can get support, providing therapy for them, really be helpful. All right. So this was a quote from one of the kids in our study. It said, truth, even in very small pieces, can lighten the load. Shame is a burden we as children should not have to bear. I thought that was powerful for, from a youngster. I also think it's important for parents to make amends, just like to, you know, as part of their recovery process for them to make amends to the kids. And um, basically what I like to do, I, I have a worksheet that I use, and I just have them, it's basically, you know, this is my, this was my addiction, it impacted my life in these ways, and specifically it impacted my life, my relationship with you in these ways. And that's the most important part. I have them sit across from the child and say, I, you know, I wasn't at your baseball games, and I really regret that. It really hurts my heart that I wasn't there for you. And when you were struggling with, you know, Mrs. Spigarelli in third grade, I, I couldn't be there emotionally for you. So I have them identify specific instances that the child will be able to relate to. And it really helps the healing process because accountability, in my opinion, is the key to forgiveness and working through something. So when the addict can own it, and that when the child knows that they get it, that makes all the difference in the world. And the more that the, I, I have found that the more specifics that they use and the more accountability language that they use and um, examples that they use, the more powerful it is. So we want it to be genuine, but they want it, you want it to be thorough. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It, sure, absolutely, if the partner needs to make amends too. There's actually, a, I have a cool worksheet where the, the um, it's like an eighth and ninth step piece where the couples can do it together, where both parties are present and they, you know, like they both make amends to the kids together. I think that's, yeah, because sometimes, you know, um, you know, the partners can have just as much impact on the, on the kids as the addict, addict does with their addiction because they're traumatized. Yeah, so absolutely. I also think when, when the addict is making amends to the child, committing to the relationship being different going forward. From now on, this is my commitment. This is what I'd like to see in our relationship going forward, making that commitment, that promise. Um, reassuring them they're loved, reassuring them about recovery, always kind of, you know, letting the child know about exciting reco uh, recovery things so that they know that this is still alive and, and blooming. Um, and, uh, of course, ongoing personal therapy for the child. Okay. So any other questions about disclosure? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. I really... I. Th I, ideally, they have both, you know, but I think that um, child therapy is a specialty. It really is, and um, not all therapists can do that. And I would privilege, if it were up to me, I would privilege a good child th therapist over somebody with a lot of sexual expertise because um, it's just really different than providing therapy for adults. Yeah, so I mean, I d it would be great if you could find uh, a child therapist that has some training in sex addiction and or sex therapy and sex education.
I'm going to kind of, uh, um, I might summarize some of these slides because these ones are actually a little wordy anyway. I'm going to talk uh, a little bit just about some of the psychological impacts um, uh, of sex addiction. Um, I'm going to kind of, so just like with the partner, uh, the kids can have all of the consequences, some of the consequences of the addiction just like the partner does, just like the addict does. So if there's job loss, public embarrassment, um, exposure, having to move, um, the child's peer network lear learning about this, all of these things, physiological consequences, emotional stress, all of that impacts the kids at home as well. Um, and the, the parental subsystem becomes destabilized. That's one of the biggest things, is the conflict in the parental relationship. And even like the most loving, nurturing parents and great parents become, this is, this is like a Mack truck hitting you. This is one of the hardest things I think that you can go through in your life. So it's going to uh, destabilize things for a little while. And I think that's normal. That's a normal reaction. So um, one of the things you'll see with the, you know, obviously when, as the addiction is going on, you might have, you know, the addict withdrawing, becoming, uh, ha you know, having a relationship with the, porn or sex, whatever it is, and um, the partner go and so the, the, there's a triangle formed there, and the subsystem's destabilized, um, and then the partner goes through their discovery process and becomes traumatized by this. And so, um, you know, this, whether it's treated or untreated, there's usually high conflict, usually tension, and a lot going on that the kids are picking up on. So um, the kids feel the effects of this stress oftentimes. It can result in confusing feelings for the child, um, inappropriate sharing of information um, that's confusing or not age appropriate, um, and emotional turmoil. Sometimes kids, they call internalizing symptoms, which is kind of withdrawing and um, you know, uh, not sharing, and others will act out behaviorally. So you kind of have two different um, common responses. Now, we ta oh, Dr. Manuela talks about sex addiction-induced trauma for partners. I believe there's sex addiction-induced trauma for kids as well. I believe that this can be a traumatic event for kids and that the level of trauma on the child depends on a lot of different things, the, the specific factors related to the case and also the resiliency level of the child. There are some, uh, if you look at the sexual abuse literature, for example, some children that have experienced sexual abuse don't have trauma symptoms. They do really well, and they don't have long-term uh, problems with it. Then you have others that are really traumatized, have PTSD because of it. So children uh, uh, vary in their resiliency. Some are going to bounce back. Um, some will s develop symptoms. Some will be uh, pretty resilient and unaffected. So. Um, just like the partners, there are different factors that affect the level of trauma for the child. If there's a child discovery, um, if there's exposure to sexually inappropriate content for the child, that can be more traumatic. If there's high parental conflict, the addict is withdrawing or decompensating. If there's high partner trauma, if there's high risk or offensive acting out behavior, it's not. It's a lot harder for a child to adjust to um, daddy is an exhibitionist, then mommy has a boyfriend. So they're not all disclosures are created equally. So the more difficult uh, the content, the more, um, you know, obviously traumatic it is for the child. Um, and obviously if there's public embarrassment or the child themselves is a victim of, of sexual abuse. Um, I talked a little bit about this. Uh, children can feel like they are pulled into the conflict of the parents, feel like they have to side with one parent or the other, protect one parent or the other. That's um, really difficult. They kind of get triangulated into the parent's relationship. And so I really try and encourage um, the parents to not uh, do that with the children. Allow them to love both parties, even if the couple is splitting. You know, always giving permission to uh, the child to love that other parent and to be close to that other parent. Um, 
So with loyalty issues, the child might see the, the traumatized partner as victimized and share in the partner's anger or resentment. Or they may act out in anger against the addict for hurting the partner or cut off their relationship with the addict. Or the child, on the flip side, may feel over, overly responsible for the addict wanting to care for them. Um, they may take on a parentified role, or try to run the household while all of this is happening to keep things stable. So as best we can, we want to keep the children in the role of children, not rely on them as confidants, not pull them into one side or the other with the parenting disagreements, um, and really you know, kind of keep those parental boundaries in place. And I think when you were able to do that, it goes a smoother. So um, like I tr if we're trying to stabilize the triangle, here's a, just a way to think about it. With the partner, we want them to keep their boundaries strong, appropriate with the children, not oversharing, not taking the victim role, but being emotionally supportive and available. With the addict, commit fully to the recovery process, com take complete and total accountability and responsibility, keep a non-defensive posture, make overtures for connection to the children and demonstrate recovery behaviors, maintain appropriate boundaries, be emotionally supportive and available. And in, then we encourage the children to openly and directly express their feelings to the addict if they are aware of the addiction. So one of the best ways to do that is to have the child do an impact letter. And usually what I do with the impact letter is I have them be specific about the areas of their life that have been impacted, express it, and de give details and examples, express their feelings. And those letters are so powerful. Um, you know, when they're shared, they're just usually not a dry eye. But it's very healing for the children to be able to express that and express those feelings and get them out there so that some uh, healing can take place. Anybody done an impact letter in here? A couple people? Yeah, it's very, very powerful. OK. Um, now, in some circumstances, you can have neglect going on when you have all of this kind of unraveling. The children can kind of, uh, the parents become a little self-absorbed and get, you know, understandably, and become less emotionally available for the children. Um, now, they, you know, kids can interpret that about their value and their worth and about their parents' love for them. If it becomes chronic and severe and ongoing, then it can constitute neglect. So. Obviously, we want to intervene in that situation before it gets, um, you know, prolonged and chronic. And really, like, I'll encourage the parents to take, you know, special time with each kid. Take, you know, take time to spend with each kid. Do something special. You know, really reaching out to work on that relationship with those kids while this is going on so that the kids still feel connected and loved and nurtured. So um, when you have that neglect, one of the things that happens with the kids over time is internalized shame. They begin to feel like they're worth less and believe that they're worth less. And so just wanting to uh, prevent that from happening by really you know, trying to keep the parents connected with the kids while this is happening. Um, now, there are, obviously, there can be, uh, the slide's a little clinical, but in a small percentage of sex addicts, you, can't, you do have some uh, personality disorders. So you have, I think it's like 5% narcissist, you have like 4% uh, like antisocial, um, a, a small percentage of borderline. Um, so it's it, they're, they're not it's not that high, but it's you know there and some of them can have features. So the addicts may need more long-term therapy um, if they're struggling with something like that, and children may need therapy around that as well. Okay. Um, sexuality. So one of the things we want to make sure with the sexuality is that the kids understand what's going on. So like for example, I had a, um, a young uh, female that I worked with and she was developing as the addict was um, going through this process and she was afraid that she was going to like, you know, can I be left, al like that other child that said, can I be left alone with him? Is he gonna be looking at my breasts? You know, that kind of thing. So talking with them, helping them through that, um, 
helping them understand sex addiction and appropriate boundaries in the home, supporting them with their boundaries in the home. Okay. Um, boundary failure, um, but, you know, in homes with sex addiction, sometimes you can have extreme boundary failure in the homes. Um, so an example of that, um, like I was uh, just asked to do a expert witness thing on a case. It's just such a poignant example where dad was very much a nudist, kind of walked around nude in the home. And so mom has pictures of him standing there with his girls, seven and ten or something like that, naked. And, you know, she felt like he, you know, I, I won't go into all the details, but um, inappropriate <laughs> boundaries. And so sometimes in sex addiction you have, um, you, you either have really rigid boundaries or boundaries that are too loose. And so to helping with the healthy boundaries um, can be really important, educating on that. I've kind of talked about that one, so... Um, you know, obviously, if we get children um, therapy, hopefully they will not repeat the behavior at a later point in time, not repeat the traumas. Um, but it is not an uncommon thing um, for, for kids to have um, trauma repetition, for anybody to have trauma repetition. So um, one of the best things I think we can do for that is to... Um, you know, provide therapy for them. So family therapy, individual therapy, other recommendations, ongoing open and honest communication, consistency, love and support, accountability from the parents, no triangulation, protection from parental conflict. So I think that's one of my last slides. So yeah, let me open it up for questions, comments. Well, I guess it kind of depends on their age. You know, like if I had, like if my 10-year-old, if I thought he needed therapy and he says I'm not really interested, I say, you know what, you're going to therapy, <laughs> you know. Um, and, uh, you know, as they get older, I mean, it, it is a little bit harder to um, force that down their throat. But um, uh, m hopefully, you know, maybe if you start a little younger, they can, you can kind of cultivate that openness in them. I don't know if there's a, if they're not open. I think you all you can really do is say, well, if you ever are, I'd like to support you in that, or um, or you can try to do some work with them at home with the assistance of a therapist, um, like through letters or meetings with them. I want to share this with you, or what have you. Try and do some of that work at home. Uh, yeah, hard. Yeah. Other questions? Y it's a differential diagnosis process. So obviously, you know, you're looking, if, if you're looking during, um, if most of the acting out is happening during manic episodes, then you might be able to eliminate it with good medication. If you get um, the mood swings under control and you know, and the sexual behavior is still happening, and it, happen it happens all the time, no matter w whether the mood is up or down, then it's not just happening during manic episodes, then, and they're starting to meet the criteria that we talked about earlier, yeah. You know, I think parents are a pretty good judge of that. Um, you know, I mean, there are some kids that they get through this just fine, and and, you know, really, don't have, you know, a lot of troubles with it. My, a couple of my siblings, you know, they're, they're really healthy, normal, never, didn't marry an addict, didn't need all the therapy that I did. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think kids are just different. Yeah. So I guess I, it's, um, I would assess kind of on a, you know, case-by-case -case basis what the child is experiencing, what their symptoms are, if they have any. So the internalizing symptoms, like what we were talking about, like withdrawing, um, sometimes the um, research has shown that the, the, the ones that are withdrawing and becoming quiet are sometimes really struggling and just don't know how to convey that. And then obviously the other, uh, the flip side of that is the acting out behavior, acting out behavior, they're getting in trouble, they're, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. 
I think I can't emphasize enough the, how important I think the stability of the parental subsystem is in terms of not triangulating them into the parent conflict. I feel like the cases where the parents are able to not do that go so much better. And so just from clinical experience of what I've seen, so I really try and encourage the parents to you know, try and not you know, bring the kids into that triangle. It can be hard, I know, yeah. Yeah, there, I, sometimes you can find resources um, for kids, especially that, you know, uh, you know there are different uh, agencies, mostly local agencies, and, and I don't know what you guys all have here, but it's sometimes easier to find resources for kids that are free and inexpensive than it is to find them for the parents. And then, and the benefit of that is that they're often child specialists, too, because that's what they're main population is. So sometimes that's a little bit easier, actually. Um, I would look more into like agencies, like Catholic charities or like, you know, com different community service agencies. And they'll often have like sliding scales and things like that. Right. Yeah, I think there, there can be guilt and shame for the, for the child and for the parents because then the parents feel guilt and shame that the child's not doing well right and the child's feeling guilt and shame like they did something wrong so i know it's very challenging um you know educating about um toxic shame and how to handle that and how to um, like I work with my kids on that s sometimes and really try and help them like if I ever hear them talking about negative shame messages you know like I'll s you know sit them down and just because you did this doesn't mean you're not valuable this you know this you're precious and so lovable and really trying to give them a lot of that positive encouragement um, you know to kind of counteract some of that shame and and also reminding kids that this isn't their fault. So many of them attribute it to something that they did. It must be, I'm, you know, you guys are fighting because of me. Um, and because they're the center of the universe, they think that it's all egocentric. So that's, they, they can't get out of that mindset. So just reminding them, this isn't about you, that you didn't do this, this is, you know, uh, this is my addiction, you, you know, you, you didn't have anything to do with this. You know, that kind of education, can, I think, can help. Yeah, thanks. Well, thank you all. I really enjoyed you all as a, as a group today, so. Thanks.